Welcome, Megan. Okay, oh, and Gemma Scott is here. She is immediate past president for the ILEA Vancouver chapter. Uh, I also noticed uh, we have a past president, Alex Bickers from Vancouver on the call. And I see our uh, Vancouver president-elect Jillian is on the call. So welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, Mia, I think it's time for me to turn it over to you and let's actually get started. Okay, sounds good. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mia Heisman and I'm the dir director at large on the ILEA Calgary board. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of ILEA Calgary, we wanna thank everyone for being here and being involved in this conversation. ILEA Calgary is honored to make our home in Treaty 7 territory, territory and on this land, which has been a meeting place for countless generations. We acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot nations, which include the Sig Siga, the Bigani, Bigaina. We acknowledge the Sutina and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'll now pass it over to Eileen to brief everyone on some ground rules and to introduce our conversation today. Thanks so much, Mia. And of course, Ilea Vancouver also acknowledges that we're based on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. And we certainly offer our respect to all the elders who've gone before us and to the elders and First Nation people on whose land we live today. So we're really excited to be collaborating with ILEA Calgary to put on this event for all of the chapters all across Canada. Um, our intention with this collaboration series is to hear from industry experts on specific topics. So we're super excited to have Kim with us here today. Um, and we also want to be able to share ideas and solutions and things that you guys have each done uh, to get through these difficult times and to prepare for the future across the country. And so when we get to the question and answer period, I highly encourage your input, your interactivity, not only in, in asking questions, but also, you know, if you have a thought or a comment that you want to share with the group, we really welcome Welcome that. Uh, our focus today is on how to effectively communicate during a crisis in general terms. However, as we all know, COVID-19, you know, has and will continue to generate its assortment of crises, and it is something that's quite top of mind for people. Uh, but what we do want to remember is that this conversation today is across the country, and guidelines and policies are different from province to province and change at different times. So, you know, in the spirit of fostering community across the country, we want to, like, be cognizant of the fact that what's you know, a, a hard, fast rule in one province might be on in another, might not be in another. So for us to listen to one another with open ears and really learn and um, be positive and supportive and compassionate as we go through this. Uh, this is about community. I really want to set this up for us to be positive. Um, so looking at when we get, especially into our uh, question and answer period, being really solution oriented and forward thinking um, and invite you all to, to contribute to that mindset. We've received some questions through the registration that Kim is going to try to address and we will bring up in the Q&A. But if you have any additional questions that come up throughout, uh, well, Kim's going to do a high level overview to start us off. Please write those questions in the chat and then we will be facilitating a Q&A afterwards. Um, we ask that you keep your, your cameras on if you can so we can see who we're talking to and you know, facial reactions and stuff are really helpful to us when we're engaging with you. Um, and then, but do keep the mics off so that we don't get interference when Kim is presenting. Um, we are recording this session. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that it turns out okay. Um, and then that can be made available to members afterwards. So we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, and that is all I have for housekeeping notes. Back over to you, Mia, to introduce our speaker. Perfect. Thanks, Eileen. Um, before we get started, a huge thank you to ILEA Calgary leadership sponsors, One West Event Design and Logistics, Brand Alive, and The Pioneer. And thank you to ILEA Vancouver's many chapter sponsors. So I'm pleased to welcome our speaker for today, Kim Blanchett, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Argyle PR. Kim is a leader in public relations, strategic communications and engagement. Kim leads the Western Canadian team of engagement, public relations and public health communicators, providing clients with over 25 years of experience in these ever-changing practices. Kim is an accredited communications professional and a member of the CPRS College of Fellows. She began honing her skills while serving with the Government of Canada and later becoming consul, 
Political and Economic Relations and Public Affairs at the Consulate General of Canada in Seattle, and then Vice President Communications and International Relations for the Alberta Energy Regulator. This summer, Kim also became the first in Canada to get her chartership in public relations from the Chartered Institute for PR in the UK. Kim is both an ambassador of the craft and an example of what it means to be a leader at Argyle as she shows organizations how they can engage, communicate, and lead with confidence. I will now turn it over to Kim for a brief presentation followed by the question and answer period. Hey, thank you very much, Mia. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I really liked your comments, Eileen, about compassion. And uh, it's interesting. Um, I was thinking of this group as I was, I had one eye all morning, like I'm sure a lot of people did, on the inauguration. And uh, so was really thinking of the challenges of this group in terms of trying to do what you do uh, in the middle of a pandemic and, and the challenges that would have faced um, the people in charge of today's ceremonies and events, um, you know, beyond the pandemic, but even with the security issues and everything. And uh, uh, so I've also been practicing self-compassion. I put a blazer on this morning. It it smells a little mothbally and it was tighter than I remember around the arms. So um, yeah, I don't know if it's just that I'm just not, not as used to wearing this, those kinds of clothes, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, year for, for many of us. So I, I do want, I'm just gonna pop my piece up here. I do wanna talk a little bit uh, about crisis. I was telling uh, the team earlier, what I've done is I've taken what is usually a half day crisis workshop, really boiled it down into the high points, uh, and just to share with you today to kickstart our, our conversation, but really looking at forward to that conversation. One of the things that Argyle, we do a lot of crisis communications where we're brought in to help organizations communicate the crisis, but we do a lot of training, really building that capacity within organizations so that they have the skills, they can plan, they can do their tabletop exercises and really be prepared for the crises. And it really is, uh, as all of you know, when you're planning events and you know that, that event plan, uh, you know, there's a binder somewhere, but all of the binders up here, by the time you get to the actual event, you know those details. There's so ingrained and that's what we hope for for crisis because you don't really know what the crisis is going to be but if you've practiced and you're prepared and you understand the methods of crisis communications then you're going to be well prepared and it really is important the studies that we've seen uh, over the past few years are that crisis uh, and the impact of crisis impacts a company's bottom line directly. And the four types of crises really are that operational crisis. So one of those is what we're in now. It's something's happened, you're pivoting, you're, you had a fire in your building, or there's a pandemic and you can't operate in the same way. Uh, there's behavioral crises. And this is really where we see, um, you know, unethical behavior by leaders, uh, misappropriation of funds, those types of ethical dilemmas. Uh, corporate, which is really uh, more the corporate performance of an organization, so maybe an organization performed really badly in the past quarter, or there are compliance issues that the, the corporation is facing. And then finally, information, data hacks, IT systems, those types of pieces. And what the studies have shown is that the behavioral crises have the biggest impact on a company's bottom line. And uh, it, it can be up to a 50% drop in the first week after the crisis. And that's followed by operations. And part of that is because those are the two biggest trust generators in that work. I want to trust the people who work for an organization. And I want to trust that organization, whether it's my credit card or it's, you know, whoever's uh, maintaining my furnace. I want to know that their operations are solid and, uh, and that I can count on them. So it really is uh, a significant cost. And Warren Buffett has often said this too, you know, lose that money and I'll forgive you, lose even a shred of reputation, I'll be worthless. And we've seen how quickly an organization can lose credibility. When you look at the, the you know, the, the scandal and flurry around the WE organization, regardless of where you stand on that organization, how quickly that came Falling, up, falling down because of the damaged reputation and the damage to trust. And at Argyle, that's really one of the key purposes of our organization is to connect organizations to their customers, to their stakeholders, to really build that public trust. So it's an important piece for us. 
Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt really quickly. Can you, I've had a request from the audience. Can you put your screen full size so that oh, we can see sure. the size? Is Thank that you better? So Beautiful. Sure. Thank you. I thought, it was, I thought it was just smaller for me. Didn't realize it was smaller for you guys. Too. Great, thanks. Um, so when, we're, when we are looking at, I'm just gonna move you guys so I can leave my slide. Uh, so when we are looking at, you know, those elements of, um, of responding, there is, the, the big key is your performance, the, your opportunity to meet or exceed stakeholder expectations. And then across the bottom, time. You do not have a lot of time to do this and it's very quick, uh, very easy to miss that opportunity. But we have seen uh, organizations actually earn trust as a result of how they have responded. So one of the, you know, the iconic examples in Canada really is made foods uh, and the Listeria crisis, how they handled that, how they were able to actually earn trust in their brand coming out of that crisis. So um, what I'm going to share with you today is kind of what our thought leadership is in, on the five trends we've seen in crisis communication with a huge caveat as we were doing this last year in 2020. And I think COVID, um, which is many, many crises and a big giant chronic ongoing crisis is a case study in of itself. Um, and I can speak to that later. But the five, five trends that we see, um, first one really is you have to make the investment. If you're going to try and invest in stakeholder relationships or customer relationships the day your crisis starts, you've already lost. And like with any relationship, you need those credits in the bank. Uh, and actually one of the, Timothy Coombs, one of the pioneers in crisis communications theory says, you know, there's a direct correlation. The more trust, the more relationship uh, credits you have in that bank entering into a crisis, the faster you will recover. And so it really is important uh, to make that investment uh, in your communications and your relationships so that you are going out to a community that already knows you, already has confidence in you uh, from the get-go. The second one, this is probably a pet peeve for anybody that's a communications background. Um, I don't know how many times I've been told by an executive that I have to get out in front of the narrative or control the narrative. And in the midst of a crisis, you can share your narrative and absolutely you should. You should be sharing what happened, what are the impacts, what are you doing about it, who's accountable and why. But your ability to control that narrative really is difficult, especially in today's kind of media frenzy, the way people hang on, get hop on on social media and start adding to that narrative, it can get out of control very quickly. So that's why we recommend really simple. This is not the time for key messaging. This is the time for getting the information out to the people who are impacted, for being compassionate to anybody who's impacted, and really providing regular updates and focusing on correcting misinformation as quickly as you can. Uh, my mother would say, you know, this one has been kicked to death and we always talk about the speed is social. And there's an ongoing debate what, right now as to whether or not is social media revolutionizing crisis communications or is it just speeding up the pace? And I would say it's a bit of a hybrid. It's a bit of both. What we're seeing is a lot of crises breaking on social before mainstream news media even finds out. Uh, when I was at the Alberta Energy Regulator, there were two oil and gas incidents that I found out about on Twitter before our emergency operations center was notified. So, you know, that, that, so the ability of social media to really raise something very, very quickly uh, really means that organizations should have pre-planned response messages. So you can get out and respond right away because if something's blowing up in Twitter and you're looking for a CEO to get your messages approved, uh, you've already lost ground. The other thing we've noticed on social is that when it's a crisis, yes, that becomes a really, Twitter becomes the news feed when something is blowing up. But what we've noticed is people tend to share and seek out trusted media sources on Twitter. So a lot of, you know, CBC, CTV, the Globals, they're, they're sharing mainstream media um, information as kind of this is the, the, the information you can trust. And we see that in kind of the post uh, debrief is that that is the information that does get trusted. But uh, the, the importance I think with social is also what we uh, counsel our clients is 
respond where you're getting it. Don't uh, don't respond on your Instagram if you know if you were pinged on Twitter. So really making sure you've got a plan in terms of who gets the keys to your social channels, who's going to respond. Often we recommend that a leader respond or somebody who's going to be the face and voice takes over the channel. So it's not just a logo that someone's speaking to. And what are your kind of methods in advance for responding to misinformation, sharing information with, uh, with your customers and your stakeholders. Uh, not surprising, apology is still absolute king of crisis response. And it shouldn't be surprising that in Canada, we actually have legislation that protects organizations so that they can apologize in a crisis and it will not be held as evidence in court. That's the most Canadian thing ever. We do a lot of crisis work in the United States and they, they cannot believe it. Um, but you know, it's think of any relationship you're in. Apology matters more than compensation, matters more uh, than the reparation that's taken place and it is what allows people to move on and the apology has to be simple straightforward and sincere what's happened you're taking accountability what you're going to do about it and it, it uh, the only caution i would say is if you're going to offer an insincere apology don't even offer one at all because you're you're then even in, in more trouble and i think we saw that we saw that this winter uh you know with um some elected officials going on holidays and some of the initial response were less than apologetic and that just threw gas on on that social media fire and people just becoming even more outraged where those that you know apologized immediately took responsibility fared a, a little bit uh, better not much but a little bit and then finally leadership really really matters in crisis and I would say about eight years ago I was the voice and face of all the crises for the organizations I worked for as the communications person I did the media often did the community outreach what we're seeing now and we're seeing this play out every day with press conferences where we have premiers and ministers and chief medical officers people want to hear from the decision makers and so CEOs executives are really expected to take ownership of these crises to take accountability uh, in times of uncertainty we really turn to these leaders and so we expect more of them uh, at a time of crisis and so we're seeing a lot more of our work going into coaching preparing leaders doing media training uh, really helping equip them to get out in front of a crisis rather than sending out the communications person a uh, couple quick examples I'm not going to dive into the 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 deep uh, case studies, but if you're looking for case studies on those that did it right, I would say the first example is Starbucks, uh, you know, in a few years ago where they had an instance um, in, in Philadelphia where two men of color were arrested uh, for loitering when they were just waiting for their friend to join them. It uh, created a huge crisis for Starbucks and the CEO immediately got on video, said this is reprehensible, said this is unacceptable, and announced their plan to close all Starbucks stores, do the um, unconscious bias and, and anti-racism training, uh, and immediately had a policy um, you know, that they wouldn't be after people for loitering, that they would open their restrooms, for example, to non-customers. So, you know, Starbucks probably spent about, they all told estimate around $18 million in the closure of stores and the training. But what they were able to regain in terms of their brand uh, and in terms of that brand reputation was really significant. And again, those elements of taking accountability right away, apologizing, using social media um, to affect, and then following up on it and demonstrating that they were following up on it was really really powerful. Another example was Southwest, uh, I believe it was in 2017, and they had a huge IT glitch, and it actually impacted over 2,500 flights. Uh, and so for four days, their flights were grounded, nobody knew where they were going, people were stranded all over the country, uh, and they immediately um, used social really, really effectively. They realized that um, you couldn't tell somebody who was tweeting you like, I can't get home for my mother's funeral. Uh, you couldn't tell them, please go to the website that was crashing every hour. So their, their social media team were empowered to actually help people on social, like literally responding to them in real time. They used Twitter and Facebook video to share updates on what was happening. They pushed out information. They, uh, everything was, if you, if you look at it, really not great production value filmed on a, on an iPhone, uh, not spent 
spending a lot of time on brand recognition here. This is not a time for messaging. This is a time to take accountability. And Southwest did that really, really well. And one of their communications uh, folks in the social media team grabbed cameras and walked around, would you know, interview the chief operations officer, the chief technology officer to explain what was happening and what the uh, company was doing and what people could expect and when they would expect the next update. Um, so contrast that to one example where I think the only thing I can say at Wells Fargo is sometimes your value is showing people what you should not be doing. So um, Wells Fargo had an issue where millions of their clients were getting credit cards and getting accounts that they did not sign up for. And what it was, was there was a culture at Wells Fargo with some very aggressive sales target, tar targets and tactics. And so employees, because they were feeling their jobs were at risk, were just creating these accounts and counting them as sales targets. What was interesting about Wells Fargo for this is uh, initially the CEO came out, he was quite aggressive. He blamed the employees, immediately fired 5,100 employees um, and said that they regretted the inconvenience. The second attempt at an apology um, came out and said that, you know, the clients that were inconvenienced and got the, the, um, the credit cards and the accounts they didn't ask for really represented a very, very small portion of Wells Fargo's total business. So basically it wasn't a big deal, even though it was, you know, more than $3 billion worth of accounts. It wasn't until they were before the Senate committee that the CEO ever said the words, I'm sorry. And that really impacted Wells Fargo. Their stock took a dive, people left Wells Fargo, um, and Wells Fargo has you know, stood as one of the case studies of not to do since. And again, it was no leadership accountability, hoisting it off on junior employees, you know, apologies that were not apologies, which made it worse. Uh, and this was something that Wells Fargo really could have, much like Starbucks, taken it, turned it into a learning moment for their culture, but chose instead to, to follow the biggest, I think, failing, which is if we wait it out, it will go away. And there are a lot of leaders and uh, organizations that feel that, like we'll just hunker down, it's gonna go away. Um, and I think we're seeing that people expect a lot of brands, they expect a lot of companies, and there's just no patience for somebody who's just gonna wait a crisis out. So that's a very, very short synopsis of a, a four-hour workshop. Just a quick uh, piece on Argyle. We are one of Canada's um, largest management-owned PR firms. Uh, we have locations across the country and in Washington, D.C., which we recently opened. And we specialize in public engagement, communications, and corporate reputation. And I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kim, for getting through all of that in such a concise manner. Um, as I mentioned, we are now hoping to have a robust question and answer period. I noticed that there was a question from, I think it was Gemma just asked, where are you based, Kim? Oh, uh, so in the before times, uh, I uh, split my time between Vancouver, the Vancouver office and the Calgary office. I am, I do live in Calgary and I'm originally from Halifax. Right on, right on. So all part of this truly uh, national call that we have here today. Um, and actually, um, we did a few shout outs at the beginning of the call. I'm now trying to reconfigure my screen so I can see everybody again. I'm working on that. Um, but I do recall from memory, um, you know, we've done some shout outs beforehand. I noticed that Liz Nutting is on the call and I believe Tara Sweeney is on the call, both representing ILEA Canada. Um, and I noticed that there were a few other uh, board members from the various chapters who've come on board. I know Kim, uh, president of Toronto, just joined us. So welcome, welcome to everybody. Um, we are going to now dive into some questions and answers. And we had some of you submit some questions um, when you registered for the event. So there's a couple in there that I want to start with. And then I encourage everyone to be adding questions to the chat as they come to you. But one of the ones that came up was, uh, Kim, what would escalate something to a crisis rather than just being an issue? Like, is there a magic line that gets crossed that shifts things? Um, yeah, I think there, uh, one, uh, if you're not doing issues management, it's going to become a crisis very, very quickly. Uh, for us, we actually, uh, we actually apply a bit of a formula to it. You know, we've got this diagram where we say, you know, what is the impact 
uh, to our stakeholders, our employees, our organization, uh, and what's the, uh, the influence of, of the people who have that impact. And so we you know, run all of our issues that we're tracking uh, through that kind of window. Who is this impacting? You know, what is their relationship to our organization? And how much, uh, how much effort are we gonna put into managing that issue? And when does it become a crisis? And for us, I think when it becomes a crisis, it really depends on the organization. But if it's a threat to your mandate, if it's a threat to your reputation, uh, and, uh, and it is enough that um, you start seeing, you know, stakeholders that are really within your sphere of influence um, really start talking about it, that's really when I would trigger it into crisis. And there are stages of crisis as well. So it might be a crisis that you're monitoring, uh, or it might be full blown, you know, all of our IT systems are down, we can't support our clients, that's, you know, full, full out crisis mode. So it really depends on your organization's mandate, what's important. What might be important to one organization might be really minor in issues management for another. But understanding, you know, your organization's goals, what your mandate is, what you're trying to accomplish, and then doing that risk analysis, what could threaten our accomplishing this? And then that, that's your list of issues to monitor. And then deciding when has that gotten to a point where we really feel it's a threat to our ability to deliver on that mandate or maintain those relationships. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, also, if any of you are more comfortable verbalizing your questions rather than typing it into the chat box, just put your hand up and I'll do my best to try to, I'm, I'm multitasking with multiple screens and multiple things, but I'll try to catch you um, and, and you can ask a, an oral question or type it in the chat. We do have another question here um, that came in with registration. Um, and this is to Kim, it's a two tiered question. So I'll ask you the first part first. What is the craziest crisis that you've had come up and how did you handle it? Um, and I couldn't, I, I, I think I mentioned, we could talk about this all day. Um, I, I would say there are two uh, and I'll, because I couldn't pick the craziest. The first I think was in 1998, I worked for the Nova Scotia uh, Department of Justice and uh, Swiss Air Flight 11 on its way from New York to Geneva crashed off the coast of Peggy's Cove. Within 24 hours, we had 500 accredited media mourning families. I was uh, stationed at the makeshift morgue uh, at CFB base Shearwater in a hangar. Uh, and we were just literally trying to get our head around what happened. I think what was wow. crazy about that was uh, we were experiencing it too. Nobody had plans for a plane literally falling out of the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the craziest things that happened on that, it, it ended up being a, a an 18 month project for me. I, I worked on until all of the victims were identified nine months after the, the crash and then went and worked on the memorial. But one of the craziest things I had to do, this was pre-social media. Um, pre yes. We had one Blackberry that the communication team shared uh, and I had to go to Radio Shack and buy 317 cell phones for everybody that was on the base so we could stay in contact. Wow. So that was crazy. Uh, fast forward to 27 uh, 2013, when I was responsible for the launch of the new Alberta Energy Regulator, which was the amalgamation of different regulatory agencies in Alberta, we launched on June 18th, uh, 2013. If anybody in Calgary realizes that June 19th, 2013 was when the floods hit. So mm -hmm. we had, um, uh, and, and oil and gas infrastructure does not do well underwater. So we had uh, had to cancel 15 events across the province. Uh, we had 700 displaced staff in Calgary that we had to reach out to. We had 100 staff whose homes were affected by the floods and we had 13 active oil and gas incidents, all that we managed in the table right here in my kitchen and three iPads uh, because our servers were also all down because power was out in our Calgary office. So that was crazy just for the sheer magnitude of it and managing a crisis much like COVID when everybody you're working with is also impacted by that crisis personally. So that was really, I think the first time uh, where the crisis wasn't something outside of our group like we were there we were responding but we weren't living it too and I think that was uh that was what made it really crazy wow thank you for sharing Joel you have a question do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question yeah for sure thanks Kim um for your presentation 
What What is your opinion um, on how uh, our governments provincially and uh, across Canada, um, federally, how what's your opinion on how they've handled the current crisis that we're in? And what are some takeaways that we can um, get from how they've done that, whether it's good or bad or whatever your opinion is on it? Yeah, I think the, the, the post-mortem on this is gonna be years long and, and insane. I think where I see, I'll start with where I think um, governments have done well, and that is you know, putting leadership out there, providing information every day straight from the source so that you can have that trusted information. I think one of the mistakes that was made early on was um, not really coordinating better province to province. And somebody that has employees in three different provinces in Western Canada that I'm managing, just the different rules and the articulation of the rules and the interpretation of the guidelines has been really, really difficult uh, for people to follow. So I think that has become, uh, that's probably a miss because that clear, consistent information has really become a piece. I would say probably one of the biggest pieces was the initial resistance to masking, which now, you know, there, there's stories that, that that evidence was already there, you know, people already knew this. So I think that we're going to see in the postmortem some of these pieces. I do think though, um, you know, to overuse the word unprecedented, we are hardwired as humans to withstand a three to six week crisis window. So, you know, something happens, you get in, you activate it, you, you, you address it, and then, you know, usually you crash four or five weeks in. You've done it, you've managed it, and you fall on the couch, and that's usually how we've managed it. I think this is the first test of chronic crisis, um, where, yeah, there are waves of kind of crisis within the crisis, but the ability to be in crisis state for over a year, almost over a year, is just really going to continue to test people. And I think that means that um, what I have seen the government not doing switching it up a bit, right? We've heard the same voices day in, day out. I don't know about you, but I start tuning it out. It starts sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. Um, and so, you know, what the strategies to bring in to share the information in a way that might resonate differently. I don't recommend a giant headed COVID monster that terrifies your, your family, but I think there are other ways to get it. And I do think um, some, some better coordination amongst the provinces in terms of messaging would have been really, really helpful. Hmm. That's Thank you, Kim. That segues quite nicely into this other question that we received from someone uh, prior to the event, um, and that is, do you think humans are getting better or worse at dealing with crises because of the pandemic? I would say even before the pandemic, just because of the way we consume social media and we consume information and we actually consume crises that aren't even ours, like how many of us were glued to the insurrection at the Capitol? And, and you know, and yet it was, you experience all those emotions of crisis and, and that, you know, adrenaline, uh, you know, hike. And, and so I think we've become better at kind of getting through the surface of it, where I think we've buried is the long-term impacts of this and the psychological impacts of something like COVID. So I think we focus on the light at the end of the tunnel, the vaccine, or, you know, we're going to, the numbers are let down. And so I can go outside this week in Alberta, uh, but we're not really, we don't have an eye on the long-term impacts of it on our mental health, on our economic health. Um, I have a couple of colleagues who have very, very young children and they're seeing developmental delays in, mm -hmm. uh, in infants because they just don't get the exposure, the social exposure. So I think we, we've we gotten into this survival mode where we're just, you know, all hanging on to that thread of, of what will get us through this. But I think we've become less adept at looking at the long-term impacts and preparing for that, which, you know, could very well be the next crisis if we're not focused on it. Interesting. Uh, and please, by all means, if anyone else has questions, either raise your hand or write it in the chat. Um, some of you, like I said, pre-sent some questions, so I'm going to keep addressing those as we go along here. Um, Kim, question for you. How do you measure the efficiency of crisis communications uh, within a crisis management team? And how do we know the crisis communication in general has been effective? So there's two, two, two questions. Efficiency uh, on your team and has it been effective? 
How do you yeah. Think? I mean, for me, efficiency on the team is, is all in the pre-planning is that everybody has a role. Everybody understands how they are to execute that role and how they report up, how we get messages approved. So the efficiency on that to me is that I'm not seeing a lot of confusion, a lot of churn in the team. Everybody has their role and they're, they're doing it. So, uh, and that we're getting the information out as we need to get it out. In terms of the effectiveness, you know, some of our markers for that, you know, are being able to address misinformation right away. So if we see that we're able to tap into rumors, they're not spreading, we're not seeing um, some of those issues pop up. We are not, um, behind the eight ball. We're providing information before we're being asked the question. So if I've got five reporters asking me the same question, I know we're, we're, we're dropping the ball, right? Because these are questions we should have anticipated and we should know because we know more about the crisis usually than everybody outside. So no, being able to, to share that. Uh, also for us, it's, you know, what are the legs of the, the story after the initial crisis phase has passed? So uh, I'll give you one example. In 2011, I was part of the team that responded very poorly uh, on behalf of the regulator to an oil spill um, in, uh, in Northern Alberta. In our defense, the oil spill happened on the day that Will and Kate got married. The next day, uh, we actually had two deaths in the oil patch and we were focused on that. The day after that, Osama bin Laden was killed. And the day after that, that was, it was the federal election where Stephen Harper got reelected. So it was Tuesday, Wednesday, before anybody paid attention to our news release that we had this big oil spill. But when I look at that, what it was one of those things we weren't, we weren't ready for social media. It was the first post BP Gulf uh, incident in Canada and we did not prepare ourselves for, uh, for the social media that would come with that. We were behind the eight ball. We weren't answering the questions. Our CEO was on vacation and we did not have a delegate to, pro to approve messaging. So we did everything wrong uh, in, in that case. And so that was when we really got our act together and said, okay, this is how we're going to get ahead of it. That incident actually led to an inquiry and a review of pipeline safety in Alberta. And there was an indication right there that the debate over the safety of pipelines got out of control over one incident because we did not do a good job on crisis comms. Fast forward to uh, a bigger oil spill with bigger impacts in 2015 that was contained. We had media on site right away. We had regular briefings. Everybody knew the information and it was treated as it was, which was kind of a bit of a freak incident. Uh, and, and we were all able to move on. So if you know three weeks after your crisis, you're still seeing media coverage, you need to go back in and debrief your response. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing those insights. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have leaders in the event industry from across the country on this call. Uh, I know I've been asking people to, to ask questions, but if any of you have any personal experience with your own crises and your own communications, um, you know, things that went really well for you or things that you wish you had done differently, like this is an opportunity for us to share our learnings with one another and in doing so, hopefully, you know, elevate everybody's capacity as an industry. If there's anybody who would like to share there, I invite that as well. And maybe, maybe to offer, I think the first glimpse I got into your world was uh, actually during 9-11 where I was uh, working for the federal government and I was doing a huge trade announcement for the prime minister. And, and we had uh, 4,000 people attending this announcement. We had lunch being brought in for everybody after. And I got a call um, from the, premier, the prime minister's press secretary who was in the air saying the World Trade Center in New York had been, you know, the plane had flown into it. They were turning the plane around, canceled the event. And so my team and I um, did not appreciate what you do with lunch for 4,200 people <laughs> and how hard it is to get people to take that lunch and uh, things like that and canceling and phoning people who were traveling. And uh, yeah, that was a, a crash course. And what do you do? You know, I've, I've canceled events with a few weeks event notice, never in the middle of the event. So Kim, what did you do with all that food? 
Uh, we actually, uh, it was very difficult to convince uh, food banks to take it because of course it was fresh food, it wasn't packaged. Uh, but we actually um, connected with a few schools and a few, uh, uh, we were right downtown with a few um, uh, soup kitchens and things like that. And we just hosted for the next day and a half said, come on in, have a meal. We kept the chairs going. We just kept the venue going uh, so people could come in and have a meal. Nice. That's actually kind of a, a warm and fuzzy story out of a rather stressful situation. Mm -hmm. um, floor is open for others to share. I do have other questions though. So if I don't get someone leaping up to share, I'm gonna pop to the next question. Ah, this is more like thinking ahead to, to young professionals. What advice do you have for young professionals who are just starting out in the, in the industry? And I would assume that's the communications industry. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, if, if, if anybody with crisis communications training, you don't get a lot of that in, uh, in school, I would say really diving into the case studies uh, is really helpful, understanding what went right, what went wrong. Uh, Duncan Corber has a, a fantastic book called Communication, uh, Crisis Communications in Canada. And what I like about his book is he uses Canadian case studies. Uh, and it's really, uh, there's such a cultural difference uh, between crisis in Canada and crisis in the U.S. So, you know, you can learn some by looking at some uh, U.S. case studies, but we're just culturally wired differently. And so our response really needs to be uh, a bit more uh, nuanced. So I would say look at the case studies, um, check out uh, either through the Canadian Public Relations Society directory or the Institute for Public Relations. A lot of really good authors there that you can ping. We're always happy to share war stories and talk about uh, the last crisis. And if you're really interested, um, the incident command system, which is ICS for short, does do training in, uh, in crisis management. A lot of people who work for technical organizations, like when I worked at the AER, we were fully trained in this. And what it does is it really defines the, those roles, which you can adapt for any organization. So, uh, and one of those roles is, is called um, PIO, uh, which is a public information officer. And that really encapsulates what your job is in crisis communication. So there's a lot of reading you can do uh, on that and, and training you can take. Right on, thank you. Um, speaking of, you know, learning, you know, I've certainly gained so much out of, out of this discussion today and, I, and I'm hoping others here on the call have as well. I invite you to share what was your biggest aha or takeaway and I do want to open the floor to try and engage with our audience who are all sitting there quietly nodding their heads and smiling. Anthony, <laughs> you're nodding your head uh, ferociously and smiling a lot. I invite you to take yourself off mute. It's because I'm a positive guy, right? You are. And you did technically ask my question, so I'm, I'm feeling satiated. I've had my uh, question, question answered. Um, but I'll come up with another one on the fly. How's that sound? And also your, your takeaway from today. Like what was... <clears throat> and and I, it just reinforced a lot of, and I'd be interested in what everyone else thinks, going in with an empathy, with an empathy first mindset and, mm -hmm. and how... You know, we often, especially within big organizations um, where, you know, we're, we're given this is how you should talk about the crisis and we follow the script and we do the right things that the boss says we should do. How do we balance and how can we better manage our own empathy and the way that we personalize the way we talk about crisis versus the corporate model that says we have to approach it a certain way? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that kind of ties into one of my big takeaways, Kim, you were saying how, you know, how how apologies are really important. And I feel like there's, and I, I love how you distinguish the difference between Canadian culture and American culture, because I think American culture is pretty quick to sue. Like you say the wrong thing and we're going to sue you and that's admissible in court. And whereas I really feel that half of the world's problems could get solved if we just apologized and just said, I'm sorry, it's, you know, I didn't mean for this to be this way. Because uh, as humans, it's that human connection, but it has to be, as you said, authentic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so how, how do we foster an environment that is just overall more empathetic and more apologetic and more humans connecting to humans? Um, you know, what's fascinating is when I uh, did my MBA um, 
I guess it was around between 2011 and 2013. So it's already some years ago now, but the shift had already started. Like it used to be corporate was all about shareholder value. And that clearly still exists somewhere because you see all these horrible stories about cor corporate greed. But what was fascinating to me is what we were being taught a lot. Like even in our corporate finance class, it wasn't just the numbers and, and the accounting laws. It was also how to create a culture of people wanting to do the right thing. Like the audits are like how to punish people when they're bad, but the actual underlying message that we were trying to instill in businesses was actually, if you create a culture of wanting to do good, that's far stronger than the punishment for doing bad. And, and, and so I think when it comes to crises, when it comes to communication, when it comes to relations, empathy, seeking, forgiveness, you know, being apologetic, human to human, there's a lot to be said for that. And, that, and, and the least empathetic thing is to robotically repeat key messages. And so we do a lot of training, did a lot of training with, you know, here are the, the things you need to get across, but they're not key messages to be read verbatim to people. And, and so I think the, to me, the, one of the most exciting things, not just in communications, but in corporate culture is the emergence of empathy. Uh, you know, my dog could bark at any minute. I, you know, someone's kid could run by the screen. I, I really hope we don't go back to these corporate personas where we have like stripped away a layer and become very human in the workplace. And I think that, you know, there's nothing more powerful. We just, we just had an, a staff meeting of the Western team today and, you know, spent a few minutes talking about how, you know, it's that pandemic wall combined with the third week of, of January. And, uh, you know, we were all hanging on to Christmas as the, the, the fun thing to do. And now people, you know, are, are really feeling tapped out. And, and, and being able to lead that conversation as a leader and not, not go in and like, okay, tell me all your problems. I've got 15 minutes, but to say, man, am I struggling this week? Like, here's how I'm struggling and opening the door and saying, wow, okay, well, here's how I'm struggling and, and trying to discuss how we can kind of support each other. Like, I just don't see flipping a switch mm. and going back to what were your billable targets? Did you meet them? Like, I, I <laughs> you know... I, I don't know how, how you can, can do that, Yeah. let alone wearing pants uh, that are not full, full Lycra ever again. <laughs> um, we have a question from Trish here in the chat, um, and that is, what would you advise event managers to share with their suppliers, vendors, and the rest of the event team as part of crisis communication? Are there things that can be shared as part of the pre-event briefing and things that shouldn't be shared with others? Yeah, I mean, there, what I would say is, um, you know, understanding, and I'm sure you all have your backup plans and, you know, your, your, your risk management plans. The more you can share, the better. I'm, I'm always been like giving as much information as you possibly can. And if there's something you can't share, saying why. So, you know, I would never share, you know, personal details uh, for, for somebody, or, you know, that's confidential. But uh, I would say there are things I can't share for confidentiality reasons. You know, I hope you understand. Here's what I can tell you. So I think, you know, we, we've always followed you. Tell people what you can let them know that there, if there is stuff you can't tell them and let them know, you know, what their updates are. I think for us, when we've had issues and I'll, I'll give you an example that's a little bit raw for me is those, those that are in Alberta probably are a little bit aware of some of the ethical violations that the AER uh, has gone through uh, with misdeeds by the CEO and executive, all of whom were fired. I was the communications lead during that time. Um, mm -hmm. I left for a reason. <laughs> and, you know, I was signaled out in the ethics report as somebody that the executive thought was the whistleblower because I refused to do work and I refused to lie to media. And for when that information was brought was made public employees were just devastated and where the i think the what i felt my team i had left but my team at least knew as much as i could tell them 
and weren't in the complete dark. And to me, uh, that old school knowledge is power, uh, you know, my value proposition is that I've got all the info is really a dangerous, dangerous sentiment. So for vendors, I would say not only just giving them, uh, you know, the tools and the information, but really I, one thing I would do is like, who's their point of contact? Who's their one person they can go to? That person will chase down information, get answers to their questions. That person will bring information into the broader team managing the crisis you know really they are um you know partners important stakeholders so if you were creating your crisis map and who you needed to uh take care of i would say that they would be a, a huge because you know they're tied to this event and and their brand is as tied to it as yours would be Mm -hmm. Anthony, I see your question. I just wanted to actually, though, before that, um, Kim, something that you said that kind of stood out to me was just, you know, share as much as you can. And I feel that I've witnessed with frustration, sometimes organizations being like, don't tell anyone anything. We're preparing this thing. It's going to be perfect in three weeks from now. So keep your mouth shut. And I'm like, no, like that, 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 that just builds anxiety. That just gets people wound up. And, um, I used to just feel very passionately to be able to share what you can share when you can share it, to be able to say, here are our thoughts of what we're trying to develop. We haven't developed it yet, but um, the more we can just kind of ease people's anxiety. And, and recognizing too, like we always, like, you know, something happens with the organization, every family member, every jerky friend on social media that knows you works there is pinging you. So we would always say, here's what we're doing. Here's what you can say if you're asked. And we would give yeah. people a few points. You know what so I mean? Helpful. You just say, like, here's, and if you get questions you can't answer, here's the person you contact. We'll get you a response to it. So recognizing that, you know, for if you've got 1,200 employees, you've got 1,200 people that are now being asked about this event. Yeah, so helpful. Okay, back to Anthony's question. Is it possible to say sorry too much? Asked by his Australian half, not his Canadian half. <laughs> um, if it's empty. If, if all you're doing is apologizing and people don't see things move along, uh, and I think, again, we saw that here in Alberta with the, uh, the whole scandal around traveling politicians, and they all came out and went, sorry, well, yeah, but well, you're back from Cabo. Like, <laughs> I could be sorry after I get back from Cabo, too. So I think it's apology really has to come with accountability and what you're going to do differently. And so I think constantly apologizing uh, doesn't help unless it's, you know, and so, you know, uh, reference to that, you know, we've seen that for, uh, you know, I think even the WE scandal, the, the apology was always out skirting around what the, the heart of the matter was. And I think, again, you apologize for the right things and don't apologize for every single thing because then uh, you, people are gonna lose trust in your ability to manage that crisis. So they need to see that apology followed immediately by action. Thank you. Uh, last call for any questions or anything anyone wants to share. If there isn't, uh, Redima, if you could go back to the slides. Uh, Kim, do you want to share any final words? Um, the only thing I'll say is uh, check out our blog at argylepr.com. We do have um, some crisis articles there. We've got quite a bit on brand versus reputation where I pick on a particularly foul-mouthed golfer on the current tour. Um, uh, but uh, this was so much fun. Thank you, Julia, for, uh, for recommending me. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. I always love talking PR, so it was a fun Thank fun you, time. Kim. And to quote Gemma, uh, Kim for Prime Minister, you're fab. <laughs> <laughs> No way, no way. No, I, I did my time as political staff. <laughs> and I was going to say, I really wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, you know, we do have politicians who can rise to the occasion. Um, it's a really tough job and, and not something that, uh, that I envy. Um, so thank you, first of all, Kim, for your amazing insights and sharing with the group. We really value your time that you spent with us and, and appreciate it greatly. Um, massive thank you to the collaborative efforts of the ILEA Calgary and Vancouver chapters for putting to the, this together, specifically uh, Julia for the connection to Kim and Mia and Redima who 
essentially put all of the you know nuts and bolts of this events together. And also, uh, you know, thank you to the ILEA Toronto and Edmonton chapters for co-promoting with us. It's really great to have people from across the country all here together on one call. And um, thank you all for joining us. So um, we have attempted to record this. Hopefully it worked, fingers crossed. Um, so stay tuned, we'll let you know if, if we got a decent enough copy and it'll be posted somewhere so that we can continue to share this with other members for people who couldn't make it here today. Um, speaking of members, I'm hoping most of the people on this call are already ILEA members, but if you are not, uh, membership has been very recently simplified, so you can now have a 12-month membership starting from the day you register for 12 full months, so you can become a new member at any point of the year, any time of year. Uh, those of us who are on the system of, you know, July 1st is our anniversary, we will re retain a July 1st anniversary date, but now for, for here moving forward, you can, you can join anytime and get a full year membership. So if you haven't joined, we invite you to speak to the ILEA membership person at your chapter. So whether that's Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, or Toronto, uh, somebody from your chapter would love to talk to you and would love to get you on board. And what's so beautiful is while you do join a chapter, you're part of an organization that is not only nationwide. So today has been a fairly Canada focused call, but you know, we've had other calls that have, have you know, integrated with the US. There's a lot of ILEA international calls that happen. There's an entire EMEA division, which is you know, the Europe and um, Middle East and Africa. So um, we, we really invite you to become a part of the bigger picture. Uh, now, we also have some upcoming events that we are working on. My understanding is Toronto and ILEA Canada are collaborating on January 26th for ILEA resources, what's available to you as a member, tools walkthrough. Um, that's 9 a.m. PST, 10, 10 a.m. Mountain and 12 Eastern. Uh, ILEA Vancouver is collaborating with MPI, PCMA and FIPA on what are the BC restart guidelines. Um, now that's specific to BC, however, COVID is COVID across the country and the event industry is the event industry across the country. And I feel like we could province to province probably learn from one another. And rather than each of us being in silos, reinventing wheels, um, to share resources and pool resources. So there is a group in BC that ILEA supports that has developed a restart guideline. Um, you can find the link on the ILEA Vancouver website as to you know, what the guidelines are and what the timeframe is. But the idea is we're trying to get everybody to agree to abide by them. We're trying to do a session as to what exactly they are. So that's February 4th. And um, we're gonna be lobbying the government to find ways to quickly, safely reopen the event industry. Also, February 11th, next collaboration that's being spearheaded by ILEA Toronto and ILEA Edmonton. And then of course, Calgary and Vancouver are all welcome. It is going to be Share the Love, ILEA Coffee Date. It's a networking event incorporating self-care elements, which is very, very important as we continue to you know, have these restricted lifestyles. We need to take care of ourselves. And that's 9 a.m. PST, 10 Mountain and uh, Eastern. So that is all I have for you today. Mia, do you have any closing words that you would like to say to the group? Yeah, just thanks to everyone for joining us. And thanks so much, Kim. That was a really great presentation. And it was nice to hear from everybody. Thank you, Mia. Redima, do you have any closing words you'd like to say to the group? I just loved this um, session, Kim. You were fantastic. I don't know if uh, Eileen was talking about me being one of the people that was smiling and nodding because I really appreciated <laughs> this talk. <laughs> but thank Thanks, you, Julia. Julia, any parting remarks? Just thanks, Kim. I've heard you talk before and I'm part of another group that Kim's part of. So I knew she would be great and I'm really glad that we got to do this and everyone kind of got to see her today. She's awesome. And just thanks everyone for joining. It's so nice to see everyone. Indeed. Yeah. So like I said, I'm seeing board members from chapters in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, and Toronto. So thanks again for being part of this big collaboration and, and for all joining us today. Uh, that officially concludes the session. Redeema, we can stop recording.